my father was Judge Albert Cartwright, once Lieutenant Governor of the state. He was killed two years ago in a mysterious accident. We were not only father and son, but, but friends. The shock of his violent death still haunts my mind. My nights are troubled by strange dreams. Albert, Albert, you've come back to me. I'm happy again. Mother, no. This man isn't father. I thought my happiness was gone forever, but you've come back to me. Mother, listen to me, Mother. Don't waste your breath, Paul. She can't hear you. I am your father now. You're not. You're not my father. Dorothy! Dorothy! What is it, Paul? Dorothy, speak to Mother. Tell her he isn't father. Tell her. Of course he is. Look at the lovely bracelet he gave me. Isn't that beautiful? Has a lion's head. Dear Father, thank you. Thank you so much. you said once in psychology class about the phenomena of dreams foreshadowing future events? Yes. But to healthy-minded people, a dream is just a dream. Come on, Paul. There's nothing like an early start for good fishing. Doc, I'd like to go home today. Home? Why, Paul, what's the matter? I'm worried about Mother. Now, look, you're not going to let a dream spoil our outing, are you? Why do you suppose Mother didn't want me home for the holiday? Oh, well, she probably had some reason. Now, get on with your breakfast. I'd like to tell you about this nightmare I had, Doc. Well, all right, if it'll make you feel better. Let's finish our eggs, and I'll get the tackle, and you can tell me on the way down. Hmm? He said, you have hallucinations. Come with me, I'll take care of you. And he held on to my arm. That was when you woke me up. Quite an extraordinary dream, but easily explained. At the inquest after your father's death, you remember, the engineer on the train testified that he caught a glimpse of the Acme Trucking Company sign as the truck pulled away. Although nothing's been seen of it since, it still remains the only clue to the unsolved mystery. Naturally, it would be impressed upon your mind. Oh, well, yes, but... And the Schumann Concerto was your father's favorite composition, if I recall correctly. But it all seems so real, and I remember every detail. The bracelet, the abandoned farm buildings, and the things this man said, like, it's just what I've been waiting for, and the terrible danger to Mother and Dorothy. Forget it, Paul. You've been working too hard at school. This is a perfect way to relax. Hey, they're jumping like crickets. Come on.
give trust and pull it up here from the school, and I figured it might be important, so I brought it up to you. Well, oh, thanks, man. No trouble. If there's any answer, I can mail it for you over in the village. Well, there's no answer. It's a letter from my father. Huh? Say, you're not pulling my leg, are you, Paul? Oh, no, Mac. Dad left a series of letters with the office of his estate. I get one every few months. Well, I'll be gone. gone. Leave it to the judge to think of something like that. Uncanny smart that man was. Well, you want to read that sort of private. Good fishing, huh? Fine, Mac. How long are you figuring on staying up here? Oh, Doc. Yes, Paul. Would you mind coming over a minute, please? Not so long, boys. Goodbye, Mac. What is it, Paul? I received one of Dad's letters. I'd, I'd like to read part of it to you. Go ahead. It will be your responsibility as the man of the family to protect your mother and Dorothy by being constantly vigilant of their associates. I have always guarded your mother, who is so much younger than I. For in my experience, I've had ample opportunity to observe the cunning of unscrupulous imposters. It's right in with your dream, doesn't it? A curious coincidence. Oh, I hate to ruin your trip, Doc, but I'd really like to go home. All right, Paul. It wouldn't do you any good anyhow with this worry on your mind, and if everything's all right, we can come back. Meantime, I can have a nice little visit with my sister. Let's get our stuff. Thanks a lot, Doc. You're welcome, Paul. You can reach me at my sister's. Okay. So long, Doc. Hello, Ben. Mr. Paul. Well, this is a surprise. Oh, I got kind of homesick. How's everything, Ben? Well, everything's about the same so far. Where's my mother? Mrs. Virginia, she went over to the club to have lunch with Mr. Curtis. Curtis? Well, who's he? Well, he's been coming around here every day for the past month. You mean he's been coming around to see Mother? He sure ain't been coming to see me. No, sir. <laughs> What's he like, Ben? Well, he's fine-looking man. Nice talking, too. But things act like in my place to venture an opinion, no, sir. You don't like him? Well, you see how it is. Being with the judge so many years, I got to know just what folks he like and don't like. And I kind of suspect this Mr. Curtis wouldn't be on the list, no, sir. I see. But don't you take no preconjected ideas from me, Mr. Paul. Team Constitution, like the judge used to say, to exert undue influence on the bench. No, sir. That's right, then. I better take your bag upstairs. Should I run you a bath, sir? Oh, never mind. I'll just take a shower. Yes, sir. <laughs> George? Yeah. Well, for guy's sakes. Well, where are you? Well, why didn't you let me know? Come on over. I want to talk to you. It's confidential. Okay. Mr. Paul home. Paul? What brought him home? Well, uh, he said he got homesick. He's up in his room. Darling. Hello, Princess. Didn't you like the fishing? Oh, it was all right, but I wanted to come home. Well, I had so many engagements, dear. Of course, if I'd realized I'm that... clean, Mrs. Cartwright. Who's the Romeo? Benjamin told you. Well, his name is Brett Curtis, and he's most charming. You know, I haven't even been slightly interested in any man since your father died. But I must admit I like this one. You'll meet him tonight at dinner, and I want you to like him, too. Are you sure he's all right? Of course he is. Everyone finds him fascinating. He's amusing and interesting. He's been everywhere, and he's most attractive. 
You know, in some ways, he reminds me of your father, except he's younger. Oh, don't look so worried. Well, you're my responsibility now, you know. Paul, you know how lonely I've been. Yes, I understand that. Darling, I've got to change. I hope you have a decent suit to wear. I've been bragging about how handsome you are. I'll probably slide down the banister in my pajamas. If you dare. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Cartwright. Hello, George. How's Lydia? Poorly, ma'am, poorly. But she'll be all right when she finds out Paul's home. <laughs> Hiya, Paul. The old guy. Gosh, I'm glad to see you. What's all this confidential business? How about this guy my mother's got in tow? Oh, him. Well, what gives? Does he rate? By me, strictly poison. Dorothy and I are washed up on account of that guy. Oh, George, says she. You're so crude and callow. Why can't you be more like Brett? Smooth and sophisticated. Women, they get on my nerves. Sounds like a purely personal reaction, George. I'm after facts. Is he solid? Well, all I know is what I hear at keyholes. Mom and Dad say he's a cosmopolitan. But for my dough, he's a first class... Oh. Hello, sis. Hiya, small fry. Hello. Well, what happened to the fishing trip, Paul? Canceled on account of family affection. What's with this Curtis I've been hearing about? You've been listening to George. You can just ignore it. Brett's positively out of this world, and the princess is mad about him. Yeah, and so am I. Well, at least he has manners, which is more than I can say for some people. Mm. Of course, it must be quite a shock to realize that one simply doesn't measure up to civilized standards. See what I mean? You know how we used to get along. Now where am I? Oh, take it easy, George. It may blow over. Nah, no, she'll never be the same. And I'm too old to change. There he is now. Fred, how are you? For me? Oh, you're too divine, Brett, really. Bring some flowers, a big droop. <laughs> You'll simply turn my head. Turn her head? I'd like to wring her neck. She thinks he's a great wit, but nothing I see is funny anymore. How about staying to dinner, George? I don't feel like facing this alone. Okay. I'll call up home. You'll have to lend me a tie. Oh, sure. Gosh, do I look all right? Maybe I should have gone home and changed. You'll do. How nice you both look. Paul, this is Brett. How do you do? I'm glad to know you, Paul. Of course you know George Hanover. Hello, George. I've been hearing quite a lot about you. Well, Mother and Dorothy have been giving you quite a build-up, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you won't hold it against me. I feel as if I'd met you somewhere before. That's because Brett looks like father. Oh, I don't think so. Except maybe his nose a little. Thanks, Paul. I'd rather not look like anybody but myself. Paul is a great deal like his father. I understand you have his talent, too. Maybe. A speck of it. I've been reading one of his books on criminology. My friend, Professor Muehlbeck, the psychiatrist, recommended it to me. The professor thinks your father had a brilliant mind. Well, father's best book was never completed. I hope I'll be able to finish it for him someday. I knew you two would like each other. Dinner, yes, sir, ma'am. Dorothy? Yeah, right. Paul, I have everything you want. Dorothy, I'm really. You don't mean to tell me you like him. I didn't say I liked him. I just said I could see why Mother likes him. Yeah, but does Dorothy have to drool over him like a goon? Oh, Dorothy's nothing but a child. Child, nothing. She's a first-class flirt. The way she hangs on that guy's words. Honest, Paul, it sickens me. Pure jealousy. Me? Jealous? Yeah. Gosh, that's right. Maybe I am. Paul, look. It was in the box that the corsage Brett gave me. Isn't it beautiful? It's a lion's head from India. Brett has such divine taste. Well, don't you like it? Nice girls aren't supposed to take jewelry from strange men. He's not a strange man. What's wrong? You're as white as a sheet. I feel...
I'll get mother. Mother! Oh, Martin. What's the matter, Virginia? What happened? I don't know. Dorothy said he simply keeled over. When he came to, he babbled something about a dream and wanting to see you. He seemed all right at dinner time. Let me see him. Feel better? Say, you know, I had an uncle once. He used to get fits. He had to put a spoon in his mouth. Oh, Doc. Well, young man, what's this all about? Darling, what is wrong? Nothing, Mother. If you don't mind, though, I'd like to talk to Dr. Vincent alone. Well, I guess I'll watch along home then. Hope you feel better, chum. Well, I'll be okay. See you tomorrow. Right. You look feverish. Oh, I just had kind of a mental shock. Remember the dream I told you about this morning, Doc? Yes. The part about Dorothy and the bracelet? Yes. Well, there's a man Mother's seriously interested in, and... Who is this man, Paul? Brett Curtis, and he did give Dorothy a bracelet. But Paul... And it was in a corsage, and, and there was the music, the same music, the Schumann concerto. This may sound kind of crazy, Doc, but... that dream is beginning to happen. Now, wait a minute, Paul. Nothing has actually happened. The only similarity to the dream is the bracelet, and that could be a coincidence. You know, Dorothy's very fond of trinkets, and anybody who knew that might buy her a bracelet. As for the music, it's probably sitting on the piano. I wouldn't worry too much about it, son. Have you told your mother about this dream? No. Mother thinks I've got too much imagination. Besides, she's gone overboard for this Curtis, and you can't talk to people when they feel like that about someone. You're pretty young to know that. Well, I felt the same way about a girl last year. Nobody could tell me anything until I found it out for myself. And you may be entirely wrong about this man. Now, the best thing to do is to find out all we can about him. Suppose you and I go down and see Bill Allen tomorrow. A banker doesn't usually take people at face value. We'll let him investigate. That's an idea. Oh, and Doc, when you go downstairs, I wish you'd drop in and meet Curtis. I'd like to find out what you think about him. All right, Paul. Now stop worrying. Come on, Paul. Mr. Allen's a busy man. Well, thank you, Mr. Allen. Goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Bill. Doctor. Good morning, Curtis. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Hello, Paul. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. You certainly gave us a scare last evening. I hope you've laid down the lot with Doctor. What he needs is more fresh air and exercise. Well, you can't pass exams on fresh air. Not in my school. No, Paul takes his studies very seriously. Come along, Paul. Good morning, Curtis. Brian. I don't suppose he followed us here. Oh, come now, Paul. The man banks there. Aren't you convinced that Alan knows what he's talking about? My intuition isn't. I take it easy on that intuition business, son. It can become an obsession, you know. Well, if you don't mind, Doc, I think I'll walk home. Well, that's a splendid idea. Do some deep breathing and try and rid your mind of Curtis. Hi there, Doctor. Going anywhere near the club? I go right by there, hop in. Oh, thanks. It's a nuisance to find a taxi when you want one. I don't drive myself. That's unusual. I thought everybody drove these days. Well, I was in rather a bad accident when I was a youngster, and it made such an impression on me that I never learned to drive. Where's Paul? Oh, he decided to walk home for the exercise. Well, the gang's here, and we're going down to the river to watch a boat race. And I thought you'd like to come along. Hello, Lydia. Oh, Cartwright. Well, if you aren't the absolute limit, not letting me know a thing about coming home. Ben, what are you doing with that picture? Miss Virginia wants it taken up to the study. Why? How can you say? Where's 
Mother. Downtown. She'll be back for lunch. Come on, let's go. We don't want to get down there after it's all over. Okay, come on. Come on, Lydia. Okay, gang, I guess we can all get in my car. Come on, Paul. Yeah, I'll see you later. Paul, are you deliberately trying to avoid me? Because if you are, I'd just as soon come right out and say so. No, I'm not, Lydia. I just don't feel like going, that's all. I sure did hate to move the judge out of his place. Well, maybe this is where he'd rather be, Ben. He spent most of his time up here anyway. Yes, sir. He looks so alive. Almost as if he could speak. I wish he could. Ben, when is Curtis coming here again? He's coming to lunch. I want you to do something for me. Anything you say. When you take his glass off the table, don't touch it. Use a napkin and put it aside. You know what I want, Ben? Yes, sir. Oh, and Ben, I'd like a sandwich and a glass of milk up here, please. Yes, sir. Do you have the keys to the files? Thanks, Ben. sufficient evidence to warrant his arrest. His quick disappearances, the failure of witnesses to identify him, the lack of fingerprints or photographs, indicated a marked talent for crime. Suspicion first fell upon Barrington when in 1932, he married a wealthy young widow, Cecilia Gordon, who was drowned within six months of their marriage, leaving him a substantial legacy. However, no evidence could be found to prove that Barrington was in the vicinity at the time of her death. Paul, oh, darling, what are you doing up here? Reading up on something in Dad's files. It's such a lovely day. You should be outdoors. I'm sorry about moving the picture. I want to change things in the living room. It's old-fashioned. I want to brighten it up a bit. It's all right, Mother. Paul, are you going to make things difficult? I haven't said anything. It isn't what you say. It's your attitude. Why don't you like Brett? I just don't want you to make a mistake, that's all. How much do you know about him? Everything. He's told me all about himself. Paul, why are you so mistrustful? I received one of Dad's letters yesterday. Maybe you'd better read it. Poor Albert. He saw so much of crime and wickedness, he was bound to become overcautious. Now I understand why you're so anxious, dear. What is it you want to know? Has Curtis ever been married before? No, he's a bachelor. He was going to be married a few years ago, but the girl drowned shortly before the wedding. Brett was terribly broken up about it, of course. She was drowned? It's quite a tragedy. She was so young. 
Well, Paul, anything else? Where does he get his income? Oh, he owns mines and things. I had Mr. Allen check into all that. You see, I'm not as irresponsible as you think I am. You're not going to marry him for a while yet, are you? I don't know, Paul. I think you should wait. Paul, I don't want to make you unhappy. But that's one thing I must decide for myself. You mean you're going to marry him right away? I may. But you can't. You've got to give me time to... Give you time? For what? Well, to... to get better acquainted with him. Darling, you'll be going off to school soon. Your life will be occupied with other things for years. Paul, try to understand. Try to be fair. Please. For my sake. All right. That's better. You'll be down for lunch? No, Benjamin's bringing my lunch up here. I'll be down later. Maybe you'll be playing tennis with Brett. He plays an excellent game. You will just give him a chance to be himself. You two would probably be the best of friends in no time. I've got to go now. Don't look too hard, honey. Paul, Lydia's furious. Oh, she'll get over it. I've got too much on my mind. Any lunch left for me, Ben? The, the sandwiches and milk in the breakfast room, Miss Dory. Oh, thanks, Ben. Hello, darling. Hello, Paul. Where have you been hiding? Well, I had some work to do. I hear you're taking law at college. Just the groundwork. My main interest is criminology. Mr. Curtis, do you believe there's such a thing as a perfect crime? It's possible. I've been reading about some perfect crimes in my father's files. He believed there were more undetected criminals at large than have ever been caught. Well, I shouldn't be surprised. The police have their limitation. What a morbid conversation. Fred, it's too bad you've changed. You could have played some more tennis with Paul. I wouldn't have time, darling. I promised to go up to Middleborough and look at some property for a friend of mine. Well, Brett, why couldn't we drive you up? The ride would do Paul good. Oh, that's a nice of you, Virginia, but uh, it'll take hours to look at tracks, and I'll be talking business. I'll phone you when I get back. I'll walk down to the gate with you. Do, Paul. Goodbye, Brett. See you later, darling. Understand you've traveled a lot. Well, yes, I've always been curious about what was beyond the next horizon. Ever been in Nevada? Yes. Magnificent country it is, too. Makes a man wish he could paint. You'd like it. What's Reno like? Oh, that's indescribable. It's a hodgepodge of wild west and wild east. Cowboys, divorcees, mink and mustangs, dude ranches, and the real thing all shuffled together. I'd like to see some of those old ghost towns. In a real silver mine. Well, I have an interest in several mines. Perhaps we'll take a trip someday. Do you know Colorado? Quite well. Waynefield must seem pretty tame after those places. <laughs> I've seen pretty much everything worth seeing. I'll be glad to settle down right here. Well, goodbye, Paul. See you tomorrow. 
I hope we're going to hit it off together. Uh -huh. attitude affect her? It doesn't yet. But he's a persistent little devil. This morning he made inquiries about me at the bank. Nothing to worry about there. Everything is in order. This afternoon he was looking through his father's files. When he came downstairs he asked me if I believed there was such a thing as a perfect crime. You'll bear watching. Has she accepted you? She hasn't yet but she will. What's the girl's attitude? Oh, Dorothy. A complete conquest. A little beauty, too. Be careful. I warned you before. That weakness of yours will ruin all our plans. Don't worry. Nothing will ruin our plans. I've waited a long time to get back at Cartwright. I'll make them pay for his meddling interference if it's the last thing I do. You'll do as I tell you. Don't forget I'm in this, too. Perhaps I made a mistake. Perhaps I should have kept you as a patient instead of making you an associate. Don't forget, I'm concerned with the financial outcome in this case, not your personal revenge. You have nothing to complain of. Everything's working out. The boy is the first hitch. He sounds like a subject for mental analysis. He might suggest it to the mother. Sometimes these cases destroy themselves. The important thing is to get the wedding over with as quickly as possible. When you are legally in possession, we can take care of him here. Funny, that thought was in my mind, too. Why wait till I'm in possession? As her husband, you would be in a position to comfort her. As her fiancé, such a tragedy might cause a revulsion against you. That's true. Therefore, you must lose no time. The stakes are high, and there's constant danger if the boy is following the Barrington trail. Barrington is legally dead. <laughs> Fortunately, so is the judge. However, fools and children sometimes stumble upon details which even the most careful strategist has overlooked. I had better meet the lady as soon as possible. Meanwhile, you must impress her with my professional distinction. Understand? Perfectly. Now, be careful. If you can't accomplish this within the week, our relationship shall revert to that of doctor and patient. I'm spending the weekend with them. I'll have her consent before Monday. I give up. Brett, you bewitched the bike. I seem to be lucky in everything but love. You don't really mean that. Virginia, why do you keep putting me off? You promised me you'd give me time to think it over. You know how much I care for you. You've both been lonely. Why should we put off the happiness of being together? Where's the water is wonderful! Keep away quietly and I'll send you announcements out later. Good. We'll elope. No. That <laughs> sounds so young and reckless. They don't seem right with two grown children. Brad, you do like them, don't you? Like them? A handsome, full-grown family on a silver platter? And you? What more could we realize? 
darling. Do you realize that you haven't kissed me since we've been engaged? Privacy around here, is there? <laughs> well, that's family life. Why don't you come in for a swim? Brad, the water is wonderful. <laughs> oh, about a swim, but didn't you? Oh, no, darling, you go. I want to write the dinner invitation. Is there anyone special you'd like to ask? Well, yes, my old friend, Professor Muehlbeck, you know, the psychiatrist. You'll enjoy meeting him. Ooh. Enjoy your swim, darling. I wasn't supposed to tell you this, but... I think it's only fair you should know. Oh, I kind of suspected. I guess they didn't tell me because they know I don't approve. No. I don't either. What? I thought all you girls were goofy about it. No, I was at first, but not anymore. Uh-huh. No, really, Paul, I mean it. Remember the other day by the pool here? Yeah. Well, Brett came for a swim. Once when I dived under, he... I don't know how to tell you this. I, I haven't told anyone. What happened? Well, he... He swam underwater. Got a stranglehold on me and, and started kissing me. I know it doesn't sound like very much, but... It was horrible. I can't describe it. I pulled away. He followed me and and said he hadn't meant any harm and, and asked me if I'd just forget about it and be friends. I felt sort of queer about him ever since. You won't mention this to him, will you? No, and don't you say anything about it. What you've told me adds up with other things. What other things? Oh, I can't tell you now. The trouble is I may be wrong. I haven't any proof, just a hunch. Nobody wants to believe me. I believe you, Paul. Thanks, sugar. Well, there's Dr. Vincent. I've got to talk with him. We better run along with you. Oh, but Paul, I, are you... Well, what I mean to say is, you still like me, don't you? Well, sure. But everything's on ice for a while. No dates. Yes, all right. Honey, don't forget. Okay, funny face. answers to some inquiries he made. After reading them, you'll probably agree it looks like a clean bill of health. Well, that may be so, but Lydia just told me something. Would you mind coming up to my room a minute, Doug? Not at all, Paul. in with what Lydia told me. This way. This drawer was locked. It's been opened. Maybe you just thought you locked it. No, I'm sure I locked it yesterday. I hadn't opened it since. Curtis was here, too. May I come in? Or is this a private huddle? Hello, Doctor. Hello, Dorothy. The princess wants you in the drawing room. There's a big psycho something or other that she wants you to meet. Spend a breath. You too, Paul. Oh, I don't want to go down. But, Paul, you must. You can't spoil Mother's party. That's right, Paul. Come along. We can talk later. However, I must say that I... I think that we won that rubber. Why, because... Because Virginia was keeping score. <laughs> Virginia 
Mary's arithmetic is delightful. She subtracts by counting backwards on her fingers. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. That means ten minus five equals six. <laughs> Psychiatry, Professor. It must be very interesting. I'd love to be psychoanalyzed sometime. I'd be delighted to do it. Anytime oh, you say. Oh, oh, Miss Cartwright. Uh, Benjamin. Mr. Curtis will come. Well, my friend, here's a chance to display your domestic accomplishments. <laughs> it's just what I've been waiting for. Just what I've been waiting for. Sorry. Paul hasn't been himself lately. An extremely sensitive boy, madame. I would like to talk to him. I have been most successful with the juvenile neurosis. It's nothing serious, Professor, I, I'm sure. Paul, what is it now? The words in my dream. Curtis said, it's just what I've been waiting for. When he said that, I could hear the train coming and then the crash. Gosh, Doc, it's spooky. It, it's got me. You've got to pull yourself together, Paul. Now, let's look at this thing realistically. I understand Bill Allen's going to announce the engagement. He's known your mother all her life. Do you think he'd sanction a match if he weren't sure of Curtis? I can't figure it out. Maybe I'm going wacky, Doc, but I could swear he's Barrington. Barrington's dead, Paul. I don't believe he is. But it's too fantastic. How is the young man feeling, Doctor? Oh, he's all right. He was just having a dizzy spell. Perhaps I can be of some assistance. Nerves are my specialty. May I come in? Well, it's just a reaction from overwork at school. Ah, yes. I was an intense student myself at his age. Do you mind if we have a little talk, young man? I feel all right. Perhaps the doctor had better go downstairs. It seems a pity to spoil Madame's party. I'd rather have Dr. Vincent stay. Of course, I have no objection. Let's sit down and be comfortable. I understand you're an unusual boy, Paul. Extremely talented. You intend to pursue your father's research into criminology? Yes. An interesting subject. But something must be done about these nervous attacks. They're not exactly normal at your age. I presume you are devoted to your mother? Of course. As one student of human nature to another, may I speak frankly? Go ahead. In some cases, filial devotion to a mother goes beyond the borderline of normality. It can frequently produce hallucinations. Did you say hallucinations? Oh, do not be offended. I'm merely stating a theory. Let go. Please don't agitate yourself. I'm only trying to help you. I don't need a psychiatrist. But you do. I believe it is your emotional aversion to your mother's remarriage which produces these neurotic symptoms. I'm sure I can cure you in a very short time. I would like you to place yourself under my care at Restview. Restview? That's a sanitarium for mental cases. <laughs> yes, but I wouldn't consider you a patient, merely a guest. Guest? Well, that's right of you. Good night, Professor. I'm sorry. I, I assure you I meant no offense. May I see you a moment, Doctor? I'll be right back, Paul. The boy's agitation reveals an emotional influence which should be corrected immediately. I hope you can persuade him. I'll speak to him. Good. Well, the same words as your dream, weren't they? It's extraordinary. Those two are mixed up together somehow, Doc. 
hallucinations. Do you believe that stuff? Well, I've read about it in textbooks. And according to him, I've got them. He seems to think so. What else did he say, Doc? Well, he wanted me to ask you to go to his sanitarium and let him analyze you. You know, Doc, that might not be a bad idea. But I don't think it's necessary. But, Doc, I might find out something up there. Yes. But, Paul, if, if those two men are what you think they are, it'd be mighty dangerous. Well, you could come up every day and keep an eye on me, couldn't you? Yes. Besides, it might be a good way to stall for time. I'd make Mother promise not to marry Curtis till I got back. But, Paul... And meanwhile, you could take these to Armstrong and get him to analyze them, their fingerprints off a water glass. Curtis? I'll talk to Mulbach. Paul, you're a very clever boy. Thanks, Doc. I'd be in a tough spot without you. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're both crazy. Then again, maybe we're not. It's a lovely room, isn't it, Paul? Very nice. I hope you'll find it comfortable. My routine is a simple one. A few heart-to-heart -heart talks, plenty of food and rest. Believe me, Mrs. Cartwright, he will return home a healthier and happier boy. I'm sure he will. Goodbye, darling. Don't read too much. You'll take good care of him, won't you, Professor? Of course, madame. I'll drop in tomorrow and see how he's getting along. Please do, doctor. I'm always happy to have the cooperation of my colleagues. Thank you. Goodbye, Paul. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, Doc. Goodbye, Princess. Goodbye, darling. I'll see you later. Please. I'll get the number for you. Well, uh, I forgot my tennis shoes. Do you happen to know where I could get a pair? I'm sure Professor Muehlbach can lend you some. Thanks. Can I help you get settled? Oh, no, thanks, Professor. There's not much to do. That's a funny place to hang your coat. Oh, I got tired of looking at myself. Same old face. 
Touch of inferiority, eh? We'll overcome that. I encourage tidiness as much as possible. Orderly room, orderly mind. I hope you have a good appetite for lunch. Pretty fair. Anything special you prefer? Oh, I'm not fussy, Professor. Uh, that's a nice garden you have. Gardening is my hobby. I'm very proud of my flowers. How about the rest of the place? Do you uh, have many patients? Quite a few, but don't let your mind dwell on that. We are facing in the direction of normality. I hope you will have complete confidence in me. I'll ask you many personal questions. You must be truthful and accurate in your replies. That's important. Remember, we're friends. Just call the office if you want anything. Is it all right if I use the phone to call outside? Well, certainly. Feel free to call anyone you wish. Thank you. I'll see you at lunch. I'd like to get Wainfield 1531, please. Hello, Vixen. What's Mixon? Oh, Paul. Where are you? I'm up at Middleborough getting my brain unscrambled. It's all very scientific. Cures hives and hangnails and improves the disposition, it says here. Are you missing my kissing? Was that some kind of code? No, just juvenile vernacular. What please is the significance? Young romance in the modern manner. Romance, I see. can't sleep. Nightmares. I'll get you a sedative. Go to your room. We don't permit the patients to wander through the corridors at night. Well, I'm not a patient. I'm a guest. I must admit the boy puzzles me. I can learn nothing from him except that he suspects you. I'm sure he knows you're Barrington. How he arrived at that conjecture, I don't know. From his father's files, I found the Barrington folder in his desk. The boy's as persistent as his father was. I won't be in a care until I get squared with the entire family. It'll be quite ironic, won't it? The elusive Barrington, married to the widow of the Honorable Judge Albert Cartwright. 
He won't be appalled, you know, but right now his main idea is to delay the marriage. He's managed that already. She promised him not to marry me until he returns. There must be some way to overcome that. Find some pretext to leave town, then persuade her to join you. You should have sufficient influence to overcome her promise to the boy. I will detain him here as long as possible. As soon as I have word from you that the ceremony has been performed, this troublesome opposition can be eliminated. How do you propose to do it? I will attend to it. Come in. Mr. Curtis, ma'am. Oh, Brad. I didn't expect you so early. I had to see you, dear. I have to go to Washington on business. Oh, darling, what a shame. I want you to come with me. We can stop off at Richmond and be married. I couldn't do that, Brett. I, I promised Paul. Are you going to let Paul spoil things between us, Virginia? Oh, darling, don't even think such a thing. Then come with me. We'll turn the trip into a honeymoon. Couldn't you wait till Paul gets back? I feel so much better about it. Virginia, from the first moment we met, everything went perfectly between us. Then Paul came home and you began to change. Oh, nonsense. We announced our engagement. Everything will go as we planned. Let's go down and get the license and have it over with today. Right now. I couldn't. Very well, then. Just as you wish. I'll be leaving this afternoon. I'll be gone for several weeks. But do you really have to go? Perhaps it'll be just as well if you have time to think this out alone. I want you to be sure of your feelings, Virginia. But I am sure. You know that. Then why not marry me and stop worrying about Paul? I can't help being concerned about him, Brett. He's my own boy. But he's getting the best of care. You back will have him well again in no time. Let's call him up and find out who he's getting along. Of course, he's doing splendidly, madame. You have no cause to worry. No need to delay your marriage. Allow me to offer my felicitations. Hey, goodbye. How long will it take you to check some fingerprints? Whose are they? Curtis. Paul got them. He asked me to turn them over to you. He's a chip off the old block, all right. The judge hung on like a bulldog whenever he got his teeth into anything. Mm, that's right. I'll have these checked just to prove there's nothing to it. Let me see. Where does Curtis hail from? Oh, he's lived in Oregon, Nevada, Colorado, California. California's good. They get thumbprints on driver's licenses. Curtis says he doesn't drive. Well, we won't take his word for that. Check those with Washington, Tom, and try the California License Bureau. Okay, Chief. So long, Doc. I'll let you know, Doctor, if anything develops. Goodbye, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you. the door was not locked? Why should it be? Sometimes we lock doors as a precaution against somnambulism. Miss Farber notes here that you complained of having a nightmare. Can you tell me about it? Only that something dangerous was going to happen. Do you have such dreams often? Yes. Can you remember anything definite about them? The train, my father's death. I dream of that often. I understand, of course. Shocking accident. It preys on your mind. It wasn't an accident, Professor. It was murder. That was never proven. You have some theories on the subject? Yes, indeed. I should be interested in hearing them. Well, I'd rather not talk about them now, Professor. It gives me a headache. Very well, Paul. What would you like to do by way of diversion? Oh, I see you have some binoculars. They must be good ones. They are excellent. Would you like to examine them? Could I? Of course. Go right ahead. Take a good look. Come along. You can see rain view through them from the roof. There's the county seat down there. From here you can see Wainfield.
see the ferry crossing the river. What's that building down there? Just an abandoned farm. Uh, over this way, Paul, you see the ferry? You can almost distinguish the people's faces on the deck. Binoculars. Yes, they are. Well, there's Dr. Vincent. We'd better go down. Yes, sir. Would you mind going to your room? I'd like to have a talk with the doctor, and then I shall send him to you. glad you came, Doctor. I'm having a little difficulty. I feel there's something on Paul's mind which he does not confide to me. If there's something you know, you may speak freely. All I know is he has nightmares about his father. Now that he has told me, but he will not say any more. His reticence hinders my diagnosis. If you could persuade him to discuss these matters more fully, it would be of great assistance. I'll see what I can do. Where is Paul? In his room. Show Dr. Vincent to Cartwright's room, please. Thank you. Come in. Hello, Doc. How are you, Paul? Sure glad to see you. How's Mother? Oh, a little worried about you. Otherwise, all right. I saw her this morning. Well, Professor Muehlbach's a good host. I'm enjoying it here. That's fine. Oh, look, Doc, I found something in Plato I'd like to show you. Oh, yes, yeah. Great chap, Plato. Modern today as he was in his own time. Paul, how'd you like to take a little ride with me? Well, that depends on Professor Muehlbach. We'll have to ask him. Well, let's do that. Well, how do you find your patient, Doctor? He looks rested, but I'd like to take him for a drive in the fresh air so he won't feel shut in here. That is, if you have no objections. Not at all. Provided you don't keep him out too long. Oh, a half hour or so. We'll take a drive through the hills. This is beautiful country. I trust you will urge Paul to relax and talk more freely. Uh, I'm very anxious for him to get straightened out so he can go back to school. If he falls any further behind, <laughs> I'm afraid he'll overwork again. <laughs> of course. Well, come along, Paul. We won't be long. That was luck. I didn't think he'd let me go. He couldn't very well refuse. I saw Armstrong. He's having the prince checked. And Paul, while I was at the city hall, I saw your mother and Curtis go into the marriage license bureau. But, Doc, she promised me. I know how you feel. It hasn't been easy for me to accept this situation either. Maybe you won't have to. What do you mean? There's an abandoned farm building near here, exactly like in my dream. I saw it from the roof. Paul, one ramshackle old building looks much like another. Maybe. But something very strange happened on that roof this afternoon. I had a feeling that Neil Bach was going to shove me off when you drove up. Are you sure you're not just imagining these things, Paul? Sure, I'm sure. And I'll tell you something else, too. Curtis drove himself up here last night. Curtis driving? That's strange. He told me he couldn't drive. I know. That's why I got the license number. I thought maybe you could find out who owns the car. <laughs>
certainly call a turn on this one. take it right over to his office. You'd better. I'll have to go back or Milbach will get suspicious. You'd better stop here, Doc. I'll walk the rest of the way. No use taking any chances with that evidence. I don't like to see you go back in there feeling the way you do about that place. Oh, I'll be all right. I've got to go in and stall for time. If things get too hard, I'll, I'll phone Lydia and say I'm lonesome. That'll mean get here quick. All right, Paul, but take it easy. I'd better go home and clean up a bit, then I'll be right over to Armstrong. So long, Doc. Darling, don't be angry. Surely one day doesn't make that much difference. I promised Dr. Stone he could marry us. You wouldn't want me to hurt his feelings, would you? I reckon it would go over there now. Why wait? We can spend tonight and tomorrow at the lake and then go on to Washington. After all, I must think of that contract, Virginia. Even a man in love has to think of business. All right. I'll call Dr. Stone and see if he can't find some time free. He ought to be able to work us in somewhere. A ceremony doesn't take long. Do you want me to call him? No, I'll do it. to do and a few letters to write. I'll just have to know a tree in my room with Dorothy and tell her the news. She goes back to school on Monday. I won't have another chance to see her. I hope I may look forward to your exclusive attention on our honeymoon, Mrs. Curtis. Well, you shouldn't call me that, not yet. <laughs> it's very unlucky, you know. <laughs> with all the luck I have, I can afford to be reckless. I'll phone you later, darling. Every day. 
That's the story, Mr. Armstrong. And strange as it sounds, you must admit it's not just a figment of Paul's imagination. Well, I've run across some strange disclosures in my career, but the stream detection beats anything I've ever heard. Want me? Yes, take a look at that. Hey, where did this come from? Paul Cartwright dug it up on the Bamman farm at Middleborough, near the Mulebach place. Oh, I'll be doggone. All we need now is the truck that goes with it. Better start a search up there. Send the car out. Any news on the fingerprints? No, not yet. Put in the call and speed it up. Miss Farber, didn't you get that number yet? It must answer. Lydia's waiting to hear from me. Hello? Hello? What do you mean by disconnecting the phone when I'm trying to get a call through? I want you to be absolutely quiet. You are agitated. I was afraid your outing today would be too much for you. I'm getting out of this place, but quick. Not in your present condition, my boy. You are hysterical. I couldn't possibly allow you to leave in such a state. Allow me? You don't think you can keep me here if I want to go, do you? I'm afraid that may be necessary. You seem to be forgetting that I'm a guest. All my patients are guests. Sit down, my dear boy, and calm yourself. Tell me, what has upset you? Was it something you found at that farm where you went this afternoon? You followed us. I observed you from the roof with the binoculars. All right, since you know so much. We found the truck that killed my father. The police ought to have the evidence by now, and I know you and Curtis were mixed up in it. Again, you were having hallucinations. <laughs> I've been trying to reach you for the past hour. I went to the station for tickets. We're being married tomorrow noon. That's impossible now. I'll explain when I see you. We've been half an hour at the east end of the golf course. I'll be there. I don't like to exaggerate Paul's danger, Mr. Armstrong, but that place up there gives me the creeps. I'm uneasy about the boy. Why does everything take so long? The machinery of the law, Doctor. It's much better than it used to be. Armstrong? Farber? The car driven by Curtis is registered under the name of Charlotte Farber. Does that name mean anything to you, Doctor? Well, yes. She's New Box secretary, eh? Put a blanket out for it. Get going. Chief, the California Motor Vehicles has a thumbprint on Brett Curtis. It matches the print taken from the body in the mine identified as Barrington. That means Curtis was killed in the mine, not Barrington. Paul was right. And Barrington was just coming up to pull something like that, too. Then it is unlikely that Curtis could be Barrington. Well, Chief, we got what's left of the truck, buried under a ton of hay. Any fingerprints? Yep, in the tool compartment. There are those. They match all right. They match the Curtis prints Paul got from the water glass. Well, are you satisfied? Go to the country club. Pick up Bet Curtis. Suspicion of murder. Cartwright case. Hey, hey, hey. We've got to get to that boy, Armstrong. You back and Curtis are working together, and there's no telling what may have happened to him by this time. The men in the mailbox place said Middleburg. Now, don't worry, Doctor. We'll find out in a few minutes. Tell me about tomorrow. That I'm so thrilled. Mother's going to let me be a bridesmaid. Isn't that wonderful? I thought we might drive down to the florist and get dozens of roses and take them to the cottage. I want to do something special, and I'm sure the princess would love it. That's a charming idea, Dorothy. I should have thought of that myself. Well, then, let's go. Now, just a moment. I was going to meet somebody here. But I'll, um, I'll leave enough for them. Don't be long. Sir, that's strange. Come on, Doctor, my car is downstairs.
Mr. Curtis asked me to give this to you. Thank you. Mrs. Cartwright's marrying that droop Curtis the first thing tomorrow. How do you know? Uh -huh. Well, I saw Dorothy and Curtis come out of the forest with a big box and they drove off in her car. Mike Pettis told me they were going to decorate the cottage on account of Mrs. Cartwright. Curtis and Dorothy have gone up to the cottage alone? Yes. Listen, Paul. Uh, just a minute, Doc. Curtis and Dorothy have gone up to the cottage together alone. What? Doc, uh, my sister and Curtis went up to Lakewood. She's alone with them. Uh, Mulebach knows the police are happening. Anything can happen. We're getting out there. So long. Come on, where's the car? Outside. Lydia, you better stay here. You're me. I'm coming with you. Well, why doesn't somebody tell me something? You must be mistaking me for someone else. Lucky. I'm glad you think so. Why are you looking at me like that? 
Because you're very lovely in the moonlight. Well, everybody is, but I adore compliments. The best I ever got from George was, oh, come on, you look all right. You know, Brett, I've grown out of that crowd. I don't know what I ever saw in them. I'm really quite poetic at heart. Only it's positively lethal to let anybody know about it in our crowd. They simply jeer. I heard a car, didn't you? Probably out on the main highway. So tight. Oh, I'm sorry. Steps are so uneven, I was afraid you might fall. Really, Brett, I think we'd better not. I must be getting back. Mother will be worried. Where's your spirit of adventure? I thought you were romantic. All right. But we won't stay long. Don't go back. It's all over. 